you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Let's, let's get it. We've got 20 minutes, I think. So let's cover as much ground as we can. And there's lots I want to cover with you. You being a former EU trade commissioner know more than most about trade and negotiating and achieving deals. So what's it going to take, Lord Mandelson, to get this UK-India FTA over the line? Well, it's going to be uh, a further long haul, I suspect. Right. I mean, they've had, what, 10, 11 rounds of negotiation. <coughs> These trade negotiations are never easy. No. Free trade agreements have gone somewhat out of fashion uh, since my day as Europe's trade commissioner. Uh, they squabble uh, the entire time over, you know, who's getting enough, who wants more, whether the two things, whether the gains for each side uh, are, are balanced. I mean, in theory, it should be easier for Britain to do a free trade agreement with India mm. than for the European Union. The European Union is ra has rather sort of aggressive agricultural uh, demands and asks, and famously, India is very defensive uh, on agriculture. Mm. like to protect subsistence uh, farmers. Um, instead, Britain is asking for some reduction in tariffs in industrial goods, but more opening up and liberalization of markets in services. Here's the problem, though. Britain doesn't seem to have enough to give in mm. return, mm. partly because India isn't asking uh, over a very wide canvas uh, for lots of things from this trade agreement. But also what it does tend to export are wonderful and large numbers of software engineers. Yeah. And the British government is sensitive about movement of people. Yes. Even though, heaven knows, our economy needs software uh, uh, engineers Do you see uh, in so many sectors all over the country. But the, Brit the, the government is sensitive uh, about this, and so we have not reached anything like a sort of e equilibrium in asks and Do we get offers. an interim deal first, and then after the Indian election, you, you go full whack, or is that not to our, is that not what we want? You might get an optical. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> something or other. Something or other before the election. But time's running out. Give me, give me a date. When does it get done by? I'm going to put you on the spot, because you're, you're good at being put well, on the spot. When will it happen? Here's exactly... The point. Yeah. The moment one side says, oh, we need it by this time, yeah. then that is an open invitation to the country you're negotiating with to raise uh, its price, so don't increase dates. its demands, uh, and, and because they feel well, all they have to do is to sit back if the other side is in such a tearing hurry and wait for them to fall over. As a man that knows what it takes to be a trade negotiator, what goes on behind the scenes? What's the secret, Lord Mandelson? This what happens in those room full of stacks of coffee that go on all night? What would give us the secret juice of a meeting, a negotiation between two countries? Go on. Look, there have to be two big ingredients. Mm. One is uh, something to offer in return for what you're asking. And if there's not that balance, that sort of balance in the ledger, uh, then you've got problems. And secondly, political will. Mm -hmm. Both sides have got to really want to reach a conclusion, really want an agreement. Do you sense that? Or yes, yes or no? Do you sense that from both parties in this? I think that what India is sensing is that Britain's rather more desperate for it than they are. Right, and that's not and a good thing. And there lies the problem. It's, yeah. a, it, it's difficult. Look, here... The, <laughs> We're desperate. When we left the uh, European Union, the Brexiters made two great big promises, a wonderful uh, free trade agreement with the United States and an absolutely wonderful mm. free trade agreement with India. Uh, they are either not coming or coming slowly or not at all, I'm afraid. And that's creating, I think, a degree of desperation in the British government, India negotiators, uh, sense this and say, well, well, we'll just hold out. We'll just hold out until they yeah. offer us more and more and more and ask for less and less just to get a, an agreement. And that's a terrible way in which to negotiate a trade. What agreement. we have achieved, though, Lord Mandelson, is we, we, we've joined the CPTPP. We, we haven't. haven't we? <laughs> I, don't ask me what it stands for, but I, it's, I, it's, I some, it's some trade 
I, I can tell you partnership it, 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 in the Indo-Pacific. It's the original Trans-Pacific uh, exactly. uh, partnership, and now it's become a uh, comprehensive. Big deal for you or not? Big deal. I mean, we've got this tilt. Are you a tilt man or not? uh, We'll come to the tilt in a moment. That's not really about uh, trade. No. No, but I am a a, a, a CPTPP man. You are good. Uh, Good. um, (laughs) You're showing off now. I'm I'm supportive of it. Yeah. It's not going to be uh, economically transformative, certainly not, you know, in the short term. But over the medium and long term, it's very important for Britain okay. uh, to be part of this uh, trade pact. I've always supported Britain joining it, uh, and I'm glad that we have. The tilt, then, which is separate. Tilt is slightly yes. different. Tilt Fan is, of the tilt or not? Tilt is more about geopolitics and, and security. Um, yes, uh, I think it is a, a, a desirable thing uh, to do to demonstrate our commitment to what is a very dangerous region, a mm. very dangerous uh, neighbourhood, lots of potential conflicts and frictions. And if Britain uh, views itself, wants to view itself as a, uh, a, as a global player, then we've got to play our part uh, in making sure that there is um, an equilibrium in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. We face uh, the rising and enlarging strength economic weight, military capability uh, of China. Mm. And in my view, uh, that needs to be balanced uh, uh, across the region. And if we can play, make a modest contribution to that, I think we should. I wrote this question down, which ties into that answer perfectly. India's growing geopolitical importance has come at the expense of other key players in the region, such as China and Pakistan. Unfortunately, these consequences aren't being adequately considered by global policymakers. Fair or not? Well, I'm not quite sure what the point is that Mm. is being made uh, there. Uh, I don't think we're doing anything at the expense of China. I think what we are doing is establishing a balance, an equilibrium um, within the region, and I think that's necessary. My own uh, view uh, of China uh, is that we need both to deter and engage. You need a sort of collective security system uh, to put in place an effective deterrence should China ever consider throwing its weight around uh, in the region and uh, elsewhere in the world. But at the same time, you need to engage uh, with China. Uh, We need a good, strong future relationship. I mean, we, we in the West, Mm. we in Britain, we in Europe uh, 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 and in the United uh, States. We want to sort of rebuild an international system uh, in which uh, China uh, is a strong, equal partner. But that does have to be, on the other side of the ledger, balanced by an effective collective security system, uh, of which I'm glad to say now increasingly India is seeing itself as an essential part. What did you think of Modi's trip to the U.S.? I, I welcomed it yeah. uh, because uh, I think he got the uh, reception and welcome and treatment uh, that he is due as the uh, leader of uh, the world's biggest population, mm. world's biggest democracy, and potentially the world's biggest um, a developer and consumer of advanced technologies. And if, you, if I were to place any emphasis in the future relationship... Uh, between India and the United States and the West more generally, it will be in the technological uh, realm. Uh, I think uh, India uh, has quite an important question to ask itself. Is it going to develop its technological prowess, its ability uh, to develop software and develop uh, sort of hardware, as it were, by itself on its own, in which case it's going to be quite a slow progress, Or is it going to do it in combination with others, with other players, other countries, other manufacturers? What's the answer to that question? And I think it should go the latter. The latter. Partly because it will be quicker. Yeah. uh, Partly because I think that uh, India's, both its economic and its geopolitical role, is served by its forming part of that wider, broader um, ecosystem, at the centre of which... 
uh, the United States uh, sits, because it will become a more sort of, it will become a, a bigger player, faster than it would otherwise do. It will become more technologically capable. It will also be able to do more and contribute more into the global economy and the international trading system if it has more to trade. Uh, uh, the, 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 the problem, one of the problems of uh, undertaking a trade negotiation with India, just to go back to your first question, mm -hmm. is that India doesn't actually export a great deal. The potential it has to export both products and services, I don't just mean software engineers, is very great indeed. But it needs to accelerate its economic uh, uh, progress. It needs to deepen uh, its technological uh, capabilities. It, it has to integrate itself more into global trade uh, patterns. It's doing so, but very, very slowly. Mm. The potential to do so much more, so much more quickly, in my view, is great. And the great driver of that, in my view, is going to be mm. technology. India likes bilateral relationships, making these one-on-one -on -one partnerships. There's a few mini polar I2U2, the quad, but it tends to forge. Look, here's the problem. Yeah. Most of my adult life, India has been non-aligned, Yes. Not a very proactive um, actor in the international system, mm. and it hasn't been a fast-growing, globalizing, or trading nation. All that, in each of those respects, is changing. Yes. India no longer non-aligned because of the rise of China, because of the uh, pressures on its own security, not only at its border, but within the, the wider uh, Indian Ocean. It sees its security interests aligned much more with the United States and the West, but also, you know, in terms of global economics and trade, uh, India wants to take its place, I think, uh, in the international trading system, in the global economy, driven, as I've said to you already, by uh, technology. And this is creating uh, a very, very significant re-evaluation by India and a very substantial rebalancing of India, both domestically and in the global economy and in respect of security mm. in geopolitics as well. This is, what is the, this is why India is going to be uh, one of the most significant defining countries in the rest of my life. China is another. The United States is another. The European Union, if you take collectively yeah. all its member states, is another. India how, is going how, to be defining, a defining country uh, for the rest of my uh, How life. does the UK play the global game, game without neglecting its neighbours? Um, it's not either or. Uh, I mean, yes, we've left the European Union, and so, the, so we have given up on the, the great sort of foreign policy multiplier that we had when we were members of the European Union. I mean, we have, in a sense, relegated ourselves. We've chosen to do that uh, through that vote uh, in, in the referendum. So we've got to find new and different ways of uh, re-establishing um, our contribution to the rest of the world, our credentials, soft power, military, to an extent economic, uh, in the rest of the world. We've got to build up other alliances in the world. One way in which we've done that is in the Indo-Pacific uh, through the AUKUS uh, um, agreement uh, that we forged with the United States uh, and uh, Australia. And by the way, just make me, let me make this point mm. about AUKUS. That's not just a sort of trilateral relationship between the United States, Australia, uh, and Britain. Obviously, its primary pillar one is about supply, supplying um, a, a nuclear-propelled submarines to Australia. But there's a pillar two, which has a much broader um, casting of its net across very many other countries and will be technologically driven. It's about sharing uh, technological capabilities, innovation, putting different 
countries and companies and businesses as well as state sectors in a sort of ecosystem mm. um, in which we acknowledge each other's contribution and role, benefit from what everyone else is doing as part of this uh, technological uh, e ecosystem uh, and making sure uh, that uh, it, it, in all those ways we are ahead of the technological curve mm. in the future rather than sort of languishing behind, say, for example, China. Put your hand up, physical audience, if you think I should spend the next four minutes, 38 seconds, asking Lord Mandelson about UK politics. Okay. I've written down seven questions. Very, it's I, our I'm quick... I'm not sure people are actually... Anyway, it, go on, it's our try. quick... I'm calling it a quick fire round, and... No, I don't know or I can't the give an answer. The problem with these quick-fire questions is, is, is that it obliges you to be so honest. I know, which we love. And you can be honest. <laughs> That's okay. why you love them. Give me the it? month of the election. Uh, May, June next year. May, June next year. Okay. The outcome. Labour. The majority. Could be considerable. Depends on how Labour performs between now and then. Big, much bigger majority than 97? Of similar course not. Sort of of course. <laughs> Why not? Because that was a triumph. It's a landslide. <laughs> Why not, though? Really? Is it possible? Everything is possible. But unlikely. No, I didn't say unlikely. Or I'm just putting words. Does, I was just teasing you. Does Boris Johnson... I'm teasing myself. Does Boris Johnson come back? No. Please, God, no. Never? <laughs> Never? Will he... MP, No. No. Party leader, no. no what does no, he do? No, 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 no. He goes off and writes and earns buckets of money to addressing obscure audiences in far-flung places of the world. <laughs> How many terms does Starmer serve? Oh, he, 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 I think a good two. He certainly needs them because of the, the missions he set himself to rebuild the country and to change the country will require two terms. Two terms. You, the, he'll, and the second term will be as big a majority as the first, or will it be tighter, the second election? They're usually tighter, but it rather depends on how effectively the Conservative Party are fighting each other and tearing each other to bits. What happens if and when <laughs> Labour wins the next election? What happens to Sunak? Oh, my God. I mean, I, he'll, be, he'll last about three minutes. And then? They'll kill him. And then? Who they, becomes the leader? Kill him. Who becomes the leader? Oh, I don't know, some sort of fringe individual. Gillian Keegan? I'm not She was here today. I'm so not absolutely gotta... sure who Gillian Keegan is. Um, <laughs> education she's the, she's secretary. She's the education secretary. Yes, exactly. She's very she was good. here today. Very good. Very yeah, good. Yeah. Very good. She's possible. Yeah. Advice to Star... I don't actually think she's possible, because I think, isn't she more you... on the centrist, moderate side? Yes. So she's, she's been touted as a future So she's leader. in a minority. I mean, it will go to some sort of hard-nosed, head-banging, sort of fringe, conservative fe uh, personality. Yeah. yeah. Could you go back into government if they, if they tempted you? Could they lure you back in? Could anything lure you back in? All the tea in China, India, wherever? No? I've done my bit. You've done your bit, haven't I've you? I've done my bit. What would be your advice to Starmer... The day if and when he wins the election. You've been there, you've done it, you've got the T-shirt. What's your advice to an incoming Labour government? You can elaborate with this answer. Given all the lessons you've learned, what would you tell him? What would be that note in the White House on the table? What would you leave him as advice? Go for it. Be absolutely ruthless about the people you put into the most important positions. Yeah. Because you need, to, you need talent. Secondly, be absolutely clear about your priorities. You can't do everything. Therefore, your priorities, turning around the economy, rebuilding the health service, creating educational opportunities again uh, uh, for people, bringing about the green transition, very importantly, both for climate and industrial reasons. And lastly, giving power back to communities so mm -hmm. that, that they can run themselves in a in a tidier and more secure way. Those have got to be the priorities. Other things can come subsequently. And you've got to galvanise, therefore, the government. You've got to galvanise the country, get them behind this national um, effort to drive forward these five missions over your term, 
establish some measurable benchmarks about what you're achieving so that the public know uh, what you're succeeding in and make yourself accountable uh, through that transparency uh, for what you're doing. A completely different style of government, in other words, from what we've grown used to over the last 10 years. Are you impressed with the Labour team, the depth of the yes, Labour I team? Am. Can they fill those positions yes. credibly? Yes, they can, but, you know, horse, horses for courses. Mm. And so the... The picks, the choices the leader makes uh, if he were to enter the uh, number 10, as I believe he will, are very important. Lord Mandelson, thank you. Pleasure. Thank you.